Hello, Dave from Shuri CC. As I welcome you all to this session, I'm a proud Fintrama Vishnu Vijay and your lecturer for the Advanced Audit and Assurance paper. So, folks, in this session, we will be starting a new syllabus area that is Part C, Quality Management. So, what is quality management all about? What all, what all topics do we have to look at over this particular syllabus area? Let's take a look at that, shall we? So, small syllabus area, and these are basically the lineup of topics that we have. First of all, we have accepting audit appointments. It's basically where we learn how we accept a particular audit engagement. And then we look at as to what an audit engagement letter is. We look at the concepts of quality management and the elements of quality management as well. We look at ISA 230 audit documentation, the types of audit documentation, standardized work papers. We learn about automated working papers, modifications of documents, security of work papers, IT based systems and retention of working papers as well. So quite an interesting set of uh, topics, isn't it? So let's get started with the first topic that is accepting auditing appointments. So when we talk about accepting audit appointments, the first thing that you should keep in mind is what all are the methods in which we can accept a particular audit engagement or how does an audit firm get an opportunity to audit a particular client? Let's understand that first of all, shall we? There are three basic methods here. First of all, there is something known as direct client request. It's kind of a straightforward process. It's all about, it, it's basically when a particular audit client approaches the audit firm to you know, uh, request them to conduct the audit. That's basically it. That's basically as to what a direct client request is. As simple as that. Quite straightforward as well, isn't it? And then we have certain other methods as well. So the second method that we have is advertising. Okay, folks, what would advertising be? It's basically when the audit firm advertises themselves, isn't it? As simple as that. But however, there are some rules to advertising as well. Let's take a look at that. Uh, when we advertise our audit firm, it should not disrepute ACCA or any other professional body. So that's basically the first and foremost rule to, uh, you know, follow, isn't it? And what else? The advertisement should not discredit ACCA or any other firm that provides professional services or the accountancy provision. So whatever we are advertising, we shouldn't disrepute others or we, we shouldn't provide a bad image to the uh, other competitors or other profession, uh, professional bodies or, you know, accounting profession itself in any manner. Okay, folks, that's basically the idea here. And the next aspect is it should not discredit the services provided by competitors. Okay, folks, you shouldn't, you shouldn't, uh, you know, you shouldn't say that you're number one and all the others are bad or anything like that. Okay, folks, that shouldn't be the, you know, that shouldn't be the tone of your, uh, I would say, advertisement. That's basically something that I would uh, point out. And what else? The... <clears throat> Advertisement should not mislead the readers. Okay, folks, whatever you are advertising, advertise the truthful things. That's basically the idea here. Don't give them, uh, you know, unnecessary expectations that, uh, for example, uh, let's say if we are advertising that we provide 100% assurance, is that possible? No, not really, isn't it? We don't provide 100% assurance because we only provide a reasonable level of assurance, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. Okay, folks, do not mislead the users in any manner. And of course, uh, it should comply with all the laws and regulations. Some jurisdictions may have some sort of laws and regulations regarding advertisements as well. So just follow that, comply with those and then advertise your services. Okay, folks, that's basically as to what advertising is all about. Now, moving on to another method that is tendering. So what is tendering all about? Well, tendering, to put it very simply, it's basically when uh, the audit client announces that they require an audit firm to audit them. Okay, folks, that's basically it. And what happens is all audit firms who are capable of conducting the audit, what they do is they prepare something known as a tendering document and they will send this particular tendering document to the audit client. Okay, folks, it's kind of, it's kind of like, you know, 
you know, uh, applying for a CV in a particular job. That's basically the thing. Okay, folks, so a particular organization announces that they have a job vacancy and all the candidates in their curriculum vital are resuming to the particular organization, isn't it? So just like that, the particular audit client announces that, you know, they require, uh, it is required, they need an audit firm to conduct their audit, the financial audit or statutory audit, and then, uh, you know, all the audit firms end up tendering document to them. Okay, folks, and the client selects the best uh, audit firm uh, out of those tendering documents. That's basically the idea behind tendering. So let's take a look at this. Tendering is where the audit client announces that the company is looking for an audit firm. So the audit firm will then send a document called the tendering document. Okay, folks, so that's basically what a tendering document is. And this will contain the following things. So what are the contents of a particular tendering document? Let's understand that, shall we? It will have an overview of the audit firm as to what the audit firm is and what they do. And of course, the, the level of expertise of each firm has in the industry. Okay, folks? So what exactly is our uh, experience within the industry? Have we audited similar clients, uh, you know, like this particular audit client that we're uh, sending the tendering document to? That's basically another thing that we look at. And what else? A list of companies audited by the audit firm that is similar to the audit client, as I mentioned earlier. And then we provide the resources. Okay, folks, we provide the insights on the resources that the audit firm has, such as the intellectual resources or uh, the uh, human resources that we have, the staff level. Do we have experienced audit partners, etc.? That's uh, that's basically it. And of course, the proposed audit methodology will also be uh, provided. What is audit methodology? It's basically the approach or way in which we conduct the audit. Okay, folks, that's basically it. The skills, qualification, and experience of the audit team will be provided. And of course, a proposed fee will also be provided as well. Now, a point to note here when proposing the fee is that how do we determine the fees? The fee is determined based on the level of work required, isn't it? And therefore, we must not, you know, charge a low fee just to get the tender. Okay, folks? So that's basically something to keep in mind. So that's basically all about the contents of tendering document and the methods in which we, which an audit firm gets an, uh, gets an audit engagement. Now moving on to the process that we follow before accepting nomination. Okay, folks, so let's take a look at this one. Now, before accepting the nomination to audit a particular audit client, what's going to happen is there are some processes which we have to follow, some formalities that we have to follow as part of our uh, you know, audit standards. So what we have to do is we have to conduct a process known as client screening. Okay, folks, so what is client screening all about? Let's take a look. A memory aid to remember this is F3P3R and 2M. So basically we have this list. So you can just memorize it with F3P3R 2M if that's what suits you. Or you can just, uh, you know, learn it just like that as well. However you like. Okay, folks, now moving on. The first aspect is or the I stands for independence and objectivity. Are there any threats to independence or objectivity? Or in other words, are there any ethical threats? That's basically what we are looking for. And secondly, we look for the fees. Okay, folks, so how much is the fee? Is it, is it uh, you know, acceptable? Is it as per the, let's say, ethical standards? Or uh, is there any self-interest threat due to the fee? Uh, is, it, is it, you know, uh, are we conducting low bowling activities? All these things are looked, uh, to be looked at. And then what else? We also have professional competence uh, as well. It's basically the fact that as to whether the audit firm has the sufficient level of competencies in order to conduct the audit for the audit client. Okay, folks, that's basically the thing. And then there is something called professional clearance. We will get into that and preconditions as well. We will get into that as well. Uh, then we look at the reputation of the client because if it's a reputed client, then it is risky. However, at the same time, if we conduct the audit, then the audit firm's reputation will also go up, isn't it? So that's basically something to look at. And of course, the really important factor to focus on is the level of risk in that particular client. Okay, folks, if it's a high risk client, then we would much rather not conduct the audit if we don't have the sufficient level of resources, isn't it? So that's basically the thing. And do we have the appropriate level of resources or not? That's basically another thing that we focus on. We, fo we also take a look at the management integrity as well. Okay, folks, because, you know, if we can't work with, uh, you know, we can't necessarily, as auditors, we cannot necessarily work with, uh, you know, dishonest uh, 
management or dishonest people within the within the audit client, isn't it? So that's basically the thing. We're just we're just looking for indication as to whether uh, the management integrity can be questionable or not. Okay, folks. So that's basically the idea here. And finally, we look at money laundering, uh, you know, related aspects as well. Is the organization uh, involved in any sort of money laundering activities? If yes, then we will have to report this to the regulatory authority, isn't it? So that's basically the thing. Okay, folks. So all these aspects will be looked at. And of course, we conduct, let's say, you know, know your client procedures, etc. as well. Uh, and yeah, that's basically it. Now, let's take a look get as to what professional clearance is all about, shall we? So when we talk about professional clearance, what we do is, the audit firm should ask the audit client for permission to communicate with the previous auditors. Okay, folks, we're not talking about new audit clients here. Okay, folks, not recurring audits. So if we get a new client, then what we have to do is we have to contact the previous set of auditors that they have with, of course, the permission of the client itself. Okay, folks, now, how exactly or why exactly are we doing this? Contact the previous auditors and ask him if, if uh, ask him for all information relevant to the decision to accept the appointment. We just, you know, uh, we just want to know if there were any issues when they conduct the conducted the audit. And of course, we also want to know if uh, there are any sort of ethical threats or any sort of suspicious activities that the organization is, uh, you know, uh, conducting or is the management honest and straightforward, etc. All these things are inquired with them. And of course, we should consider the response and assess any ethical or professional reasons why they shouldn't accept the appointment. So is there any reason why we should not accept the engagement? That is what we're trying to inquire from the previous set of auditors, as simple as that. Okay, folks. Now, that's basically as to what professional clearance is. It's all about just uh, contacting the previous auditors with the permission of the client, of course. And of course, uh, you know, if the client denies the permission, that can raise suspicion as well, isn't it? So that's basically, the, they would have to accept the, uh, you know, uh, accept the request any which ways. However, we still have to, you know, uh, as, you know, the, uh, as, uh, as part of complying with the formalities of things, we will have to ask their permission to contact the previous auditors, as simple as that. So that's basically as to what professional clearance is all about. Now, moving on to the next aspect, that is preconditions of an audit. So what are the preconditions of an audit? Let's take a look at that, shall we? So as part of the preconditions of an audit, what we do is we take a look at uh, as to whether the financial reporting framework to be applied in the financial statement is acceptable or not. Okay, folks, what is a financial reporting uh, framework? Basically, the appli uh, applicable financial reporting framework is basically what kind of criteria that we have to use to compare the financial statement to make sure that the financial statements provide a true and fair view, isn't it? So that's basically as to what it is. And uh, we're just making sure as to whether it is acceptable or not. And they have made the appropriate adjustments and we are complying with all the accounting standards and making appropriate accounting treatments within the financial statements, etc. Okay, folks, that's basically what we're trying to ensure here. And secondly, what we have to do is we have to obtain an agreement from management that it acknowledges and understand that it is uh, understand its responsibility for the following. So what are we doing here, guys? we are obtaining an agreement from the management that uh, stating that they acknowledge three things. What are, the, what are the things that they acknowledge? It is the management's responsibility to prepare the financial statement in accordance with the applicable financial reporting framework. That is the first thing that they have to uh, agree. Secondly, it is the management's responsibility that uh, to make sure that internal controls are necessary for the preparation of financial statement is operating effectively. And it is the management's responsibility for providing the auditor with access to information relevant for the audit and access to staff within to obtain audit evidence. So these three things should be agreed by the management itself. This is their responsibility. And then we just you know obtain an agreement stating that the management acknowledges this particular responsibility. That's basically all there is to it. So what all things? It is the management's responsibility to prepare the financial statements. It is the management's responsibility to make sure that the internal controls within the uh, organization are operating effectively. And finally, it is their responsibility to provide us with the appropriate level of information which are relevant to the audit. Okay, folks? So that's basically the idea here. So those are basically the preconditions of an audit. Now, moving on to the next aspect that is 
after accepting the nomination. So after the client screening process, what do we do? We accept the engagement, isn't it? So after accepting the engagement, what do we do? Let's take a look, shall we? We obtain a copy of the resolution passed at the general meeting regarding his appointment. So the auditor, what he does is he basically, uh, you know, uh, accepts the, sorry, obtains a copy of the resolution, okay, for the ordinary resolution passed regarding his appointment. That's basically the idea here. We, we've already learned that, you know, an audit, auditor is appointed during, an, during a general meeting, isn't it? Through a ordinary resolution by the shareholders, isn't it? So that's basically the thing. We're just obtaining a copy of that particular resolution. And what else? Valid notice of the outgoing auditor's resignation and confirm that they were properly removed. Okay, folks, what's the idea here, guys? We're just making sure that the previous auditor has been removed properly. That's basically it. And we transfer all books and papers belonging to the client from the old auditors as well. So what's the idea here? We're just, you know, getting all the, you know, previous work papers that the previous auditors worked on. And that's basically it. Okay, folks, just to make sure that, uh, you know, we have all the relevant information to conduct the audit. And finally, we set up and submit a letter of engagement to the directors of the company. Hmm. What is a letter of engagement all about? Let's take, let's talk about that, shall we? So, folks, a letter of engagement, or in other words, we call it the audit engagement letter as well. It's basically an agreement between the auditors or the audit firm as well as the uh, you know management of that particular audit client okay folks that's basically the idea here or i would much rather say the audit client itself okay folks an agreement between the audit firm and the audit client regarding the uh, audit that is about to be conducted okay folks so, so this particular agreement it specifies all the terms and conditions of the audit as well so let's take a look before commencing the audit the audit firm and the audit client comes to an agreement with certain terms and conditions, okay? This agreement is documented and is known as the audit engagement letter. Okay, folks, so that is basically as to what an audit engagement letter is all about. Simple thing, isn't it? That's basically it. Now, what is the purpose of doing this? Let's understand that, shall we? This will avoid any misunderstanding between the auditor and the management. Okay, so it's basically to avoid any sort of misunderstanding regarding the responsibilities of both the auditors as well as the management and what else it is a confirmation that the engagements terms and conditions have been accepted by both parties and can be used as evidence at court in case of an issue okay, folks, so if there is any sort of disagreements or issue that may arise during the course of the audit then we can use this particular agreement uh, in court as evidence to state that the management has agreed to these terms and conditions. So why are they making an issue, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. Now, what exactly are the contents of this particular agreement? Let's understand that, shall we? So the agreement will have the objective and scope of the audit of the financial statements. So what exactly are we going to do and what exactly are our limits, etc. All these things are mentioned here. The responsibility of the auditor as well as the management, kind of obvious, isn't it? And then we also have identification of an applicable financial reporting framework for the preparation of financial statements as well. So what's the idea here, guys? So we just we just mentioned as to what exactly is the applicable financial reporting framework. Are we following the IFR standards, IAA standards, or any local accounting standards, etc. That's basically it. Reference to the expected form and content of any reports to be issued by the auditor. Okay, so there's the, yeah. So there's some reference made to the, uh, you know, auditor's report as well. Auditor's report is basically the final report that we issue containing the opinion, isn't it? So that's basically it. And what else? In addition to the, uh, the following items will be included. Reference to professional standards, regulation and legislation applicable to the audit. So we mentioned all the professional standards that we follow, the regulations that we have complied with, etc. And of course, the limitations of an audit is mentioned to avoid any sort of misunderstanding. We mentioned that we don't provide 100% guarantee in any which ways or, uh, you know, we provide reasonable assurance and things like that. Uh, and what else? Expectation that management will provide a written representation will also be mentioned. Of course, whenever we require, we would obtain a written representation from the management acknowledging certain things, isn't it? So that's basically what is mentioned here. Basis on which the fee are calculated. How exactly was the audit fee calculated? This will be mentioned. Agreement of management to notify the auditor of subsequent events after the audit report is signed. So even after we sign the auditor's report, if there are any sort of subsequent events happening as per IAS 10, remember IAS 10 in your you know, FR or SBR paper, 
So uh, with this particular thing or during uh, or or after signing the uh, you know auditors report if there are any sort of you know adjusting or non adjusting events happening after the year end this this particular thing would should be informed by informed to the auditor by the management okay folks so that's basically the idea here agreement of management to provide draft financial statements in time to allow the audit to be completed by the deadline so in order to, in order for the audit to be completed by the deadline we need the right information at the right time isn't it so we we're just mentioning that we should obtain you know the right right materials that we need or right information that we need at the right time that's basically it form and timing of any other communication during the audit is you know mentioned over here when exactly do we communicate things to the management or when do we conduct the planning or when do we uh, discuss things with those charged with governance all these things are mentioned over here other matters that the engagement letter may cover include arrangements concerning the involvement of internal auditors and other staff of the entity limitations to the auditor's liability as well so all of these things are included within the particular uh, audit engagement letter isn't it as simple as that okay folks so that's basically the idea here so what all things do we do in recurring audits what are recurring audits this is basically when you audit the same client the next year okay folks we could you know conduct recurring audits for let's say uh you know around seven years or so isn't it so that's basically the idea here so when we are conducting a recurring audit is there any changes that needs to be made to the uh let's say audit engagement letter well that's something to think about isn't it so let's take a look in case of recurring or continuous audit what we do is we remind the management of the responsibilities uh as well as the terms and conditions etc and we revise certain terms and condition if it is deemed necessary and we reissue the audit engagement uh you know letter and then we make them re-sign it once again okay folks that's basically it's not resign or anything it's just re-sign that's basically the case the terms uh if there are if there is a significant change in the following things so we do this if there is a change happening within the organization it, because if everything remains the same then i don't think there is any need to change uh, the terms and conditions or anything isn't it so if there is a significant change in the following things that is listed below then we remind the uh, management we revise the uh, engagement letter we reissue it and get it re-signed as well isn't it so that's basically the case now what are the significant changes that they're talking about here let's take a look at that shall we so we're talking about a change in the financial reporting framework legal regulatory or reporting requirements so if there is any change in that then we have to make some changes in the audit engagement letter as well isn't it uh, and then there is the strategic level management if there is any uh, you know change in the key personnel in the organization such as a ceo etc then we have to revise the particular agreement and what else nature size financial contingents or reputation of the business if there is any change in that then yet again we uh, you know remind revise reissue and resign uh, if there's any change in the auditors and management's responsibilities if there's any change in the implementation or a major change in the systems of the organization uh, if there's a major change in the industry or business environment and if there's a major change in the audit client relationship and any indications that the entity misunderstands the objective and the scope of the audit so these are instances where we believe or we uh, you know, we will have to change, make some changes to the audit engagement letter, isn't it? So that's basically the case. Okay, folks, as simple as that. So that's basically all about the audit engagement letter. So now let's take a look at another really interesting area that is quality management. So what is quality management all about? Let's take a look. This standard sets out the quality standards that are required by an auditor so that they can ensure that services provided by them are of the right quality. So this is basically a particular approach or particular systems and measures that we take to ensure that we are providing uh, you know, services of the appropriate quality to our audit clients. Okay, folks, that's basically the case. Now, this will reduce, sorry, decrease the risk of the following uh, litigation against auditors for professional litigation that's a true statement isn't it because if we ensure that we are providing services of the appropriate quality then there's no need for anyone to uh, you know sue us in any way isn't it so that's basically the case uh, and what else 
incorrect audit opinion and hence an increased investor confidence in the financial statements. So if we provide, uh, you know, an incorrect opinion on the financial statement, then the users of the financial statements, primarily investors, will blindly believe in that, isn't it? So therefore, we have to ensure that we're conducting the audit to the appropriate quality so that we can provide the correct opinion as well. Okay, folks, so these are the two situations which can, uh, you know, uh, or these are the two risks that we're trying to reduce by following or complying with these quality management standards. Okay, folks, remember that. Now, moving on to the uh, standards itself, there are three standards on quality management that we, ha we have to learn here. Uh, first of all, we have IAC 220, that is quality management for an audit of financial statements. We also have ISQM1, which is quality management for firms that perform audits or reviews of financial statements or other assurance and related service engagements and ISQM2 or International Standards on Quality Management 2 engagement quality reviews as well. Okay, folks, so these are basically the quality management standards that we have to follow to make sure that we are providing high quality services to our audit clients. Okay, folks, now moving on. So remember guys, uh, a little about this particular set of standards. IAC 220 focuses on individual level quality control. Okay, folks, these are basically the measures that each and every individual within the audit firm must follow. However, when it comes to ISQM1, it's about firm level quality control. What exactly should the audit firm do as a whole in order to comply with audit, uh, quality control or quality management standards? Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. And then we have ISQM2, which is engagement quality review. Okay, folks, so engagement quality review is usually conducted for listed entities primarily. And then there are also they're con conducted for complex or highly uh, high risky clients as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically the thing. So yeah, <coughs> we will be looking at each and every standard or all, all of these, you know, standards are embedded into the elements of quality control. So let's take a look at as to what the elements of quality control are all about, shall we? Uh, so when we talk about elements of quality control management systems, there are around eight elements so what are these? Let's take a look at each of these, shall we? First of all, we have leadership responsibilities. Okay, folks, what all, what all does the leader of the, uh, you know, engagement team must follow? And what exactly must he ensure to make sure that the entire audit team is conducting the audit to the utmost quality? That's basically as to what this particular element is all about. Then we talk about ethical requirements as well. Of course, everyone within the audit team must comply with the ethical requirements as well as auditors, isn't it? So that's basically the case. There is acceptance and continuance as well, which is basically uh, the quality control measures which are to be implemented as part of accepting and conducting continuous audit, isn't it? So that's basically the case. Then we talk about engagement resources, what kind of resources should we ensure that we have? And of course, there is engagement performance as well. So what all things should we ensure while conducting the audit? And we talk about monitoring and remediation. We will get into that. The overall responsibility of the audit, this is primarily, uh, you know, uh, primarily the overall responsibilities with the audit partner themselves and of course finally the documentation aspects as well. Okay, folks, so these are all the elements that we will be looking at as part of quality management system. Now let's take a look at each of these elements one by one shall we? First of all we have leadership responsibility and what does it say? Let's take a look. <clears throat> the engagement partner takes the overall responsibility for managing and achieving quality of the engagement and this requires a clear commitment to quality emphasizing the following things. Okay, so who has the overall responsibility of ensuring quality? The audit partner. And who is the audit partner? Well, when it comes to audit, we have a hierarchy, isn't it? At the top, we have the audit partner. Or as we call it, uh, this is a bit too big, one second. So yeah, the leader of the particular audit would be the audit partner. And the audit partner will have a lot of audit managers under them, isn't it? There will be audit senior managers as well as, you know, or just audit managers as well. And the audit managers oversees the work of audit senior, key folks or senior auditors, however you like to call them. And then uh, the audit seniors oversees the work of audit 
juniors or as we call it you know associates or interns as well okay folks so that's basically how the hierarchy flows isn't it so the overall responsibility of managing the entire audit process lies with the audit partner and he has to ensure that okay, folks at an individual level he has to ensure that each and every team member is complying with the following things okay folks so let's take a look he must emphasize that uh, he should ensure that all team members are responsible for contributing to quality Okay, folks, so that's basically it. It, 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 it. He or she must make sure that each and every member within the audit team is complying with the quality control standards and they are ensuring quality in their deliverables as well. And secondly, he must ensure that the importance of professional ethics, values and attitudes are, you know, uh, are kept in mind by each and every audit team member. Uh, the importance of uh, he, he should emphasize the importance of open and robust communication with the team and the ability of the team to raise concerns without fear of repressal. So what's the idea here, guys? If any of the team members have identified any sort of issue, then definitely they will have to highlight it, isn't it? However, the audit partner here, what he has to ensure is he has to ensure that there is an open communication platform where each and every individual team member can, uh, you know, discuss their findings and raise concerns, etc. Okay, folks, so that's basically as to what the audit partner must do here. He must provide an open communication platform. For example, if we are conducting a, let's say a board meeting or any sort of meeting, uh, be it, uh, an, uh, let's say an audit planning meeting or a normal discussion about, you know, the audit topics that can be tested for your exam or the way we conduct our live sessions as well. So, uh, you know, when we're when we conducting those, if you have any sort of questions, or if any and every one of the you know member of that particular meeting has a, a question or concern the as the one who hosts the meeting i should ensure that your opinion or your voice is heard isn't it so that's basically as to what an open communication platform means okay folks as a host of the meeting or whoever is the host of or leader of that particular meeting he must ensure that everyone's opinion and voice is heard he okay, folks so that's basically the idea here now moving on he must emphasize the importance of each team member exercising professional skepticism throughout the engagement. Professional skepticism is a really necessary skill as, a, uh, as an auditor, isn't it? So that's basically something uh, that the audit, uh, audit partner must ensure. Okay, folks, everyone is, uh, you know, keeping up their professional skepticism while conducting the audit. Okay, folks, that's basically the thing. And what else? Moving on to the next element, that is ethical requirements, which is kind of, you know, simple and straightforward, isn't it? So the audit partner, engagement partner must uh, identify, evaluate and address the ethical threats. Uh, he must remain alert throughout the audit for any breaches of ethical requirements. He must take appropriate action where the ethical requirements must not have been fulfilled. And prior to dating the uh, auditor's report, take responsibility for determining whether ethical requirements have been fulfilled as well. So uh, before initiating the audit as well as close to the conclusion of the audit, the engagement partner must ensure that everyone within the audit team as well as himself is, uh, you know, complying with all the ethical principles and there are no ethical threats uh, in the work that is being conducted as well, isn't it? So that's basically something that they have to ensure as per, you know, ISA 220, of course. Now moving on to the next aspect, we have uh, acceptance and continuance. So what's the idea here? Let's take a look. I have ISA 220 revised requires the engagement partner to consider the following when determining whether to accept or continue with the client relationship. Okay, so what all what all factors are need uh, or yeah needs to be considered to decide whether we should accept a particular client or continue the relation with with a particular client. Let's take a look at that. Integrity and ethical values of principal owners, management, and those charged with governance. So we have to assess the integrity of the management, isn't it? So we know that we learned that in as part of the uh, you know uh, accepting uh, audit engagements as well, isn't it? So remember that. And what else? With the sufficient and appropriate resources are available to perform the engagement. True statement, isn't it? What else? Whether management and those charged with governance have acknowledged their responsibility in relation to the engagement or not and of course whether the engagement team has the competence and capabilities including sufficient time to perform the audit and finally whether significant matters have arisen during the current or previous engagement 
uh, have implications on continuing the engagement as well. Okay, folks, what all things do we have to ensure here? First of all, uh, we have to confirm that the management is you know, not dishonest or they're honest and straightforward. And we have to ensure that we have the sufficient and appropriate resources to conduct the audit. And uh, we should ensure that the management and those charged with governance do acknowledge their responsibility regarding the you know audit engagement being conducted such as it is their responsibility to prepare the financial statement you know the preconditions that's basically it and of course we have to ensure that we have the uh, or the audit firm has the sufficient of competence and capabilities to conduct the audit and of course finally if there is any sort of significant matters that have that have arise during the previous engagement uh, you know then does it have any implications or impact on or, on continuing the audit engagement relationship that's basically the that's basically something that we have to take a look at as well okay folks so this is basically as to what continuance and acceptance is all about just a simple thing that's basically it okay folks now moving on to engagement resources so what's the idea here so when we talk about engagement resources we look at three sets of resources here okay folks there is the human resources technological resources as well as intellectual resources as well now, what are each of these? Let's take a look. When it comes to human resources, we know as to what it is, isn't it? Isn't it? It's basically the team members. That's basically it. The engagement team or it is external experts. Okay, so it's not just the audit team members, isn't it? It's also the or it is external experts that they use in various areas such as inventory valuations or fair value determination, etc. And internal auditors as well who provide direct assistance must be competent, capable to perform the audit. What's the idea here, guys? We're just ensuring that the people who, ha who have been a part of the audit is competent enough, isn't it? So that's basically it. So we talk about not just the audit team members here, but also external experts that we may have used, as well as the internal auditors. Some sometimes we use the internal audit team within the firm, within the, sorry, within the, uh, you know, audit client to ensure that uh, various processes are, you know, done appropriately or to obtain more evidence, isn't it? So we sometimes rely on their work as well, of course, by complying with a few standards, which you will learn uh, sooner or later. So don't worry about that. Uh, so, yeah, that's basically we just have to ensure their competency and capabilities. And the competence and capabilities include consideration of the following things. So how do we assess competence and capability? Let's talk about that. We can take a look at their practical experience. We can understand, uh, you know, their understanding of professional standards. Do they have it? And then expertise in specialized area of accounting and auditing, such as, you know, uh, when it comes to external experts. So do they have the sufficient level of knowledge that is required to conduct the work? Same goes for internal auditors as well. And expertise in IT or automated tools and techniques. Do we have that, you know, uh, understanding of the, uh, you know, new data analytical tools and techniques, etc. And of course, the knowledge of Relevant industries is relevant here as well. We should look at that. The ability to exercise professional skepticism and judgment should also be taken a look at. And finally, understanding of the firm's policies and procedures must also be ensured as well. Okay, folks, so all these, by looking at all these things, we would be able to ensure as to whether the human resource that we have does have the sufficient level of capability to, competence and capability to conduct the audit. As simple as that. And what else? If there is insufficient resources, or if insufficient resources are made available, the following uh, actions can be taken. So if we don't have much uh, you know, resources, then what do we need to do? We can change the planned audit approach, isn't it? So that's basically something that we can do. And we can arrange an extension to the reporting deadline. We can follow the firm's policies and procedures for resolving differences of opinion. And finally, we can withdraw from the engagement if possible under applicable law or regulation. So what's the idea here, guys? We just, uh, you know, uh, we could either change the plan that we have made or we can try to extend the deadline if we don't have the appropriate resources or we can, you know, follow the firm's policies and procedures into, you know, resolving any differences in opinion if we are negotiating or when we're negotiating with the management. And finally, if nothing is possible, then we could consider withdrawing from the engagement as well. Okay, folks, so these are the things that we can do if we don't have the sufficient level of resources. Now, Moving on to the next aspect, technological resources. So what are these? Obviously, it's kind of something that we can think about, isn't it? So, so technological resources include technology to conduct meetings, communications, uh, automated tools and techniques. The, uh, the auditor must be careful not to place too much reliance on those resources. So what's the idea here, guys? It's all about, you know, for example, if we have to conduct, let's say, virtual meetings, then we need to have software such as 
MS Teams or Google Meet or Zoom, etc., isn't it? Or you know, uh, WebEx meetings or anything like Cisco WebEx. Or uh, see, it's just that we need to have this certain level of technology or softwares in order to conduct these things. That's basically it. And secondly, do we have uh, you know uh, things like audit softwares? Do we have the appropriate uh, level of audit softwares and uh, you know data analytical tools and techniques, etc., in order to conduct the audit? That's basically what we're ensuring here. However, one thing that we have to keep in mind is that. Just because we are using these computer softwares and system doesn't necessarily mean that everything would be accurate, isn't it? For example, there is some sort of manual involvement in uh, you know, extracting data from the client, isn't it? So we need to make sure that the data has been extracted appropriately to ensure that data is complete, isn't it? So just like this, we need to ensure we can't just blindly over rely on whatever data has been generated by this particular technological resources okay folks so that's basically another really important point to keep in mind as well now what else we also have intellectual resources as well so let's take a look at as to what these are intellectual resources include audit methodologies implementation tools auditing guides templates and checklists okay folks so these are basically like audit enablers i would say that's basically it or uh, it's basically the approach that the audit firm takes to conduct the audit as well as certain templates or forms that we use in order to uh, you know create certain work papers or comply with certain regulations etc that's basically the idea here okay folks so do we have that and these allow for consistent application and understanding of professional standards. That's basically it. Okay, folks, so these are basically the resources that we need to ensure that we have, isn't it, to provide quality service to our clients. Now, moving on to another really important area that is uh, engagement performance. So when we talk about or in order to ensure that engagement performance has been done appropriately, what all things do we look at? First of all, we look at direction, supervision, review, and then EQR. What is EQR? Engagement Quality Review. Okay, folks, that's basically it. So what is direction all about? Let's first of all understand that, shall we? Direction involves informing team members of their responsibility to do, do the following things. Contribute to the management and achievement of quality of the engagement. Maintain a questioning mind and exercise professional skepticism. Fulfill ethical requirements. Perform audit procedures for more experienced team members to direct, supervise and review the work of less experienced team members and understand the objective of the work to be performed and address threats to the achievement of quality, for example, budget or resource constraints should not result in the team failing to perform the uh, plan audit procedure. So what's the idea behind direction, guys? We're just directing the audit team or guiding the audit team members to achieve their objective. What is our objective? To conduct the audit and provide the opinion, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. Okay, folks. So first of all, what we do is we contribute to the management and engagement, sorry, and achieve the quality of the engagement. Okay, folks. So we, uh, yeah, it is the team member's responsibility to provide, you know, value adding information to the particular management, as well as to ensure that they're conducting or they're providing uh, quality services to the client, isn't it? So that's basically something that the, uh, you know, leader, especially the audit partner should ensure as part of directing the particular team members. And of course, uh, you know, the, uh, we, everyone, every each and every individual within the audit team must, you know, comply or maintain their professional skepticism throughout the audit, kind of uh, straightforward. And obviously they, they must comply with all the ethical requirements. And then what we do is in order to ensure that, you know, uh, appropriate quality has been maintained, what the director in this particular situation, who is the director of an audit, I would say the engagement partner itself, isn't it? So they must ensure, or I would say the more experienced members within the team must ensure that the less experienced members work is of the appropriate quality as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. And of course, everyone should understand as to what the objective, what the objective of their work, uh, of the work that they're doing is. And finally, uh, if there are any threat to achievement of quality, such as, you know, there's, there could be time constraints or resource constraints, etc. So if there is any such, uh, you know, issues, then these should be resolved appropriately as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. Now, moving on to supervision. So what is supervision all about? It's basically overseeing the work of others, isn't it? So that's basically the thing. Now, let's take a look. Why exactly do we do this or what exactly does it involve? Let's take a look. Tracking the progress of the audit to ensure the objective of the work is achieved and adequate ongoing resources are assigned. Okay, folks, this is basically as to what supervision is. And then addressing issues arising and modifying the planned approach accordingly. For example, reassigning planned procedures to more experienced team members, 
when issues are more complex than initially anticipated. So if there were any sort of, you know, issues identified during the course of the audit, then we have to take corrective action against it, isn't it? So that's basically something that I need to point out. And what else? Identifying matters in matters for consultation where the firm lacks appropriate internal expertise. If we don't ma have much knowledge about a particular issue, or if we don't have experienced member uh, who knows how to deal with these issues, what we do is we consult some other people. Okay, folks, so this particular consultation can be done to two sets of people. One, uh, the first set of people is basically the people who are within the audit firm. Okay, folks, outside the audit team, but within the audit firm. So these could be, you know, more experienced members such as EQR reviewers or, uh, you know, audit partners, etc. That's basically it. Or what we can do is if we don't have such personals within the audit firm, what we can do is we can consult an external firm as well. Okay, folks, an external consultation firm regarding these issues as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically what is mentioned here. So if there are any matters which require consultation, then, uh, you know, we need to keep track of this. And what else? Provide coaching to help develop skills and competencies. So we provide, or the senior members provide, you know, coaching and various other, uh, you know, guidance to the less experienced members of the team so that everyone can learn everything, isn't it? So that's basically the thing. So creating an environment where engagement team members can raise concern without fear of repressal as well. Yet again, okay, folks, yet again, we have, we saw this particular same point in the first element as well, isn't it? So it's just about providing an open communication platform to raise con uh, raise concerns and issues that they've identified throughout the course of the audit. Okay, folks, so that's basically as to what supervision is all about. Now, moving on to the review aspect. So let's take a look at as to what review is all about. Review responsibilities include consideration of whether the work has been performed in accordance with professional standards, policies, and procedures, appropriate consultations have taken place, work performed supports the uh, conclusions reached, evidence obtained is sufficient and appropriate to support the auditor's report, the objectives of the engagement procedures have been achieved as well. So these are all the things that we ensure by conducting a review of the work, isn't it? So when we talk about review, yet again, okay, folks, I'm just gonna go back to that uh, hierarchy that I mentioned earlier. One second. There we go. So, as we all know, the audit junior's work is reviewed by the senior and their work is reviewed by the manager and the manager's work is done by, conducted by the senior managers and then the partner, isn't it? So, what exactly, uh, what exactly is the, uh, you know, how exactly is the, or who exactly, okay, I think, yeah, that would be a much better thing. Who exactly would review the work conducted by the audit partner? That's a, that's a really interesting question, isn't it? So this would be reviewed by a bit more experienced member of the audit team known as an EQR. Okay, folks, an EQR reviews the work conducted by the entire audit team on a particular client. Just to make sure that everything has been done appropriately and we are providing the correct opinion. That's basically what we're trying to ensure here. Okay, folks, now, that's basically how the review process works. So by reviewing each and every work paper, what they're trying to ensure is that uh, have we complied with all the professional standards, policies and procedures and uh, have we conducted appropriate consultation wherever necessary and have we provided the appropriate conclusion on those issues? And of course, uh, you know, yeah, does the work performed or have the, does the evidence that we've gathered support our conclusion? That's basically something that we look at as well. And the, is the evidence obtained uh, sufficient and appropriate to support the opinion that we provided in the auditor's report as well? And finally, is uh, yeah, the, uh, the objective of the audit procedures have been achieved as well. Okay, folks, that's basically, uh, these are the things that we're trying to uh, ensure while reviewing a particular work paper, as simple as that. Now, moving on to the next aspect, the engagement partner must review audit documentation at appropriate points during the engagement, including documentation of significant matches, significant judgments, and other matters relevant to the uh, engagement partner's responsibility. So that is basically a responsibility that the engagement partner has, isn't it? He must review the audit documentation at the appropriate points during the engagement. So during the each phase of the audit, the planning course, during the course of the audit, as well as at, at the conclusion stage, or uh, as we call it, the review stage, we the particular partner must ensure that 
quality work has be, is being conducted, isn't it? So that's basically the thing here. It's kind of uh, straightforward and significant. And if there are any, let's say, significant matters that have arise during the course of the audit, have they been addressed appropriately as well? So all these things must be ensured here. Now, moving on. So when we talk about review, we also have to learn about engagement quality review as well, isn't it? So what is an engagement quality review? Let's take a look at that, shall we? An engagement quality review is an objective valuation of the significant judgments made by the engagement team and the conclusions reached thereon performed by engagement quality reviewer and completed on and before the date of the engagement report. So remember guys, engagement quality review is a hot review, isn't it? It's kind of like a hot review. What is an hot review? Hot review is basically a review conducted before we sign the auditor's report. Okay, folks, so that's basically it. So on or before completing the data of engagement report, we conduct an overall evaluation uh, regarding the audit work that has been conducted. Have we, uh, you know, have we exercised the appropriate level of judgment wherever necessary? And have we reached the uh, conclusion? Or do we have the sufficient appropriate level of evidence to base out our conclusions, etc. All these things are ensured during this particular review, as simple as that. And an engagement quality review is a reviewer, is a partner or other individual in the firm or an external individual appointed by the firm to perform uh, engagement quality review. So in some jurisdiction, an EQR is a mandatory thing. Okay, folks. So if a particular audit firm has only one particular set of team and they don't have an EQR within the firm, then what they do is they can appoint an external firm to conduct the EQR as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically something to keep in mind. And the EQR uh, is usually conducted by uh, the experienced team members, okay, folks, which is the partners, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. Moving on. Listed entities and other high risk clients should be subject to an engagement quality review. High risk clients include those which are in the public interest, those uh, with unusual circumstances and risks, and those where laws and regulations require an EQR as well. Okay, folks, so these are what high risk clients are. Okay, folks, there are two categories of, uh, you know, clients for which we conduct the EQR, listed entities as well as EQ, sorry, uh, high risk clients. Okay, folks, so what, who are high risk clients? These are basically clients where it is mandatory required by the law to conduct an EQR or uh, there were some sort of, you know, unusual, let's say, issue that we've identified within the organization, or unusual misstatement, overall fraudulent activities, etc. Okay, folks, so these are categorized as uh, high risk clients. Okay, folks, why exactly are we doing this? Just to ensure that we are, we have conducted the work appropriately and we are providing the appropriate opinion as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically the reason. Now, moving on. For audit engagements where EQR is required, the engagement partner must do the following things. We must determine that the EQR has been appointed. They must ensure that uh, the partner or the engagement partner must uh, cooperate with the reviewer, which is the you know engagement quality reviewer, and inform other team members of their responsibility to do so as well. They must discuss significant matters and significant judgment arising during the engagement with the reviewer, and not uh, you know date of the uh, date of the auditor's report until the completion of the EQR. So we should not, uh, you know, we should not sign the auditor's report unless and until the EQR has been completed. That is basically what has been mentioned here. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. All of these are like straightforward things. You just have to remember some of these. Okay, folks, so that's basically all the uh, idea here. Now, so how can you become eligible to become an EQR? Because if you want to become an EQR in the future, then you have to know you know, how exactly or what exactly is the eligibility for that, isn't it? So let's take a look at that. We don't necessarily have to require, we don't need any other qualification or anything. It's just that we need to have the sufficient level of experience. Okay, folks, so it's just some basic eligibility requirements. It cannot be a member of the engagement team, obviously, isn't it? Because if that is the case, then there would be a self-interest threat, sorry, self-review threat, isn't it? And what else? Must have the competence and capabilities, including sufficient time and the appropriate authority to perform the EQR. So the EQR, he shouldn't just, uh, you know, allow like one hour or so to conduct the review. He should allocate the sufficient amount of time to conduct the review. Okay, folks, that's basically something that we have to ensure as well. And of course, they must comply with the relevant ethical requirement and laws and regulations as well. That particular individual should not have any ethical threats with the audit client. Oh, and they must comply with all the, you know, laws and regulations as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. 
and an engagement partner must serve a cooling off period for two years or longer if required by relevant ethical requirements before they can assume the role of EQR for the same client as well. So if let's say I, I'm an audit engagement partner and I'm, I've been auditing a particular client for quite a while now, if I have to act as an EQR for that particular client, is that possible? No, not really, isn't it? Because I have already conducted the particular, uh, you know, audit for the current year so therefore what i can't necessarily be the eqr for it as well that would be self-review threat isn't it so what i have to do is i have to have a two-year cool off period so after two years i can maybe act as an eqr rather than the engagement partner itself okay folks so that's basically the idea provided here so kind of a straightforward thing that's basically all there is to it now moving on to monitoring and remediation so what's the idea here in monitoring and remediation, we look at the monitoring aspect and we evaluate deficiencies, we remediate, or in other words, we take corrective action and we conduct an annual review as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically as to what the process is. Now let's go through it. The monitoring and remediation process must be established to provide relevant, reliable, and timely information about the design, implementation, and operation of the system of quality management and take appropriate action to respond to uh, identified deficiencies such as deficient uh, such that deficiencies are remediated on a timely basis so what exactly are we trying to do here we're just making sure that we have the appropriate measures to detect any sort of you know lack of quality or quality issues or any other issues that have arise during the course of the audit and if we have identified that such issues then have we taken corrective action or not that's basically what has been mentioned here okay folks as simple as that now moving on in order to achieve this, the firm must establish quality objectives, identify and assess quality risk, design and implement responses to address the quality risks as well. So, uh, in order to make sure that, you know, we are, uh, you know, identifying issues uh, that, that are there within the firm regarding quality related aspects and in order to make sure that we are taking corrective action against this, we can use this step by step approach. First of all, set some quality objective identify and assess what the quality risk can be. Okay, folks, we should always think of what can go wrong, isn't it? So that, that's basically what this step is all about. And then we design and implement responses to address such quality risks as well. For example, uh, the risk is that, uh, let's say the team members may not be providing uh, audits of the appropriate quality or they're not working uh, you know, consciously or they're not maintaining professional skepticism. For example, as a control measure, I can just you know train them regarding these aspects, isn't it? So that's basically the thing. Now, what else? The firm must monitor the system as a whole by inspecting completed engagements selected according to risk and taking consideration of other monitoring activities performed by the firm. What's the idea here, guys? We just, we should, you know, oversee the system as to whether or the quality measures that we have implemented. Uh, are they working appropriately? That is something that we have to ensure as well, isn't it? It's kind of like internal controls that we have within the audit firm to a certain extent, isn't it? So we just have to make sure that the particular system is operating effectively and they're detecting the risk or they are taking corrective action towards the risk as well. That's basically it. Evaluate the severity of deficiencies and uh, investigate the root cause of the deficiencies. Evaluating the effect on quality management system if there are any sort of deficiencies that we've identified from the uh, from the particular organization then we have to uh, point that out isn't it so that's basically the case okay folks so in your exam you know in in your exam you may be uh, required to point out quality issues from a particular scenario okay folks so just just keep an eye out for that and what else appropriately remediate deficiency responsive to the root cause so once we have identified the particular deficiency then what do we have to do we have to take corrective action against it isn't it so that's basically what has been mentioned here simple as that an annual evaluation is required to be undertaken as well so just just review things on an annual basis that's basically what has been mentioned here so now let's talk about peer reviews shall we so what is peer review all about we're talking about the pre-issuance as well as post-issuance review or in other words we call it the hot and cold review as well so what is, uh, what is the purpose of conducting a hot and cold review? Let's understand that first of all, shall we? A pre-issuance or hot review is conducted to enhance the quality of the assurance work. It works just to make sure that everything has been done appropriately. That's basically all there is to it. And then there's the post-issuance review or cold review. And this is basically to identify any deficiencies in the firm's processes. As simple as that, isn't it? 
So that's basically the purpose of peer reviews. <coughs> sorry, uh, post and pre, sorry, pre and post uh, review, as simple as that. And when exactly do we conduct this? A hot review is conducted before the audit report is signed, whereas a cold review is conducted after the audit report is signed. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. Now, which all files are we referring to as part of hot and cold review? Let's take a look at this. So during a hot review, we look at listed clients, work papers of listed clients, obviously, isn't it? And of course, public interest engagements. Uh, we look at engagements where there are, there are particular risks. Each partner should have some of their engagements reviewed as well. Okay, folks, so that's another rule that some uh, audit firms would have, isn't it? So each partner's work should be reviewed to ensure that they are conducting the work appropriately, isn't it? So that's basically the case. Now, when it comes to cold review or post issuance review, what's the idea here? A selection of completed engagements. That's basically as to what it is. Okay, folks, so what we do is we may have a lot of completed engagements that we have done in the past. So we're just going to reopen some of those and review some work papers to ensure that we have conducted the audit to the appropriate quality. Okay, folks, so that's basically all we're doing here. Now, who is it conducted by? Who conducts a hot review? An independent partner of the suitable experience and authority. Okay, folks, so you could also be an EQR as well. Okay, folks, now what else? Who conducts a cold review though? A dedicated compliance or quality department or a qualified external consultant uh, or an independent partner as well. Okay, folks, any of these people can conduct a cold review. And what else? What all things should be considered here? While conducting a hot review, we should process, uh, you know, uh, you, we should we should take a look at the processes underpinning the judgments made. Okay, folks, so that's basically the thing. So have we taken the right judgments when the situation required us? Okay, folks, so that's basically what we're ensuring here. And of course, as part of cold review, we're reviewing all the work papers on the audit files. Okay, folks, so that's basically it. Now, specifically, what is you know un process underpinning judgments about? Let's take a look at that, shall we? For the for a hot review, we will look at significant risks and responses to them. We will look at matters requiring consultation, the materiality level, the independence uh, independence aspect, conclusions are they appropriate? Were there any misstatements? Is the audit opinion appropriate? We look at matters to be communicated to management and those charged with governance as well. Okay, folks, so these are all the things that we look at as part of our hot review. What about cold review? Let's take a look. To ensure that all work papers are on file, we, we make sure that all, everything has been completed, everything was signed as completed, evidences, uh, you know, evidence, it, it is also evidence that's reviewed because, you know, uh, for some of the work papers, there are prepared as well as reviewer sign off being conducted. So there's that. And the work uh, undertaken is sufficient and has been documented appropriately as well. Okay, folks, so all these things are ensured during a cold review. Now, Moving on to the outcome. So what is the outcome of conducting a hot review? Well, the outcome is basically there is a reduction in the audit risk that the risk that the auditor expenses, that is the risk that the auditor expresses an inappropriate opinion when the financial statements are materially misstatement, misstated. Okay, folks. So in other words, to put it more simply, detection risk will be reduced to a certain extent. Okay, folks. That's basically the thing. Uh, and what else? Identify remedial action that uh, that should be taken. Recommend recommendations will be made, including because you know since we're conducting it after the audit audit report is signed, we don't necessarily have to do much changes to the you know work itself. But we will have to identify the mistake that we've learned. Sorry, mistake that we made and learn from that. Okay, folks, that's basically the thing. Okay, folks, so we take remedial actions wherever necessary, and recommendations will be including communication to communication of findings and then additional quality reviews being conducted on future engagements. Uh, we provide training to our staff regarding certain aspects. And of course, we, uh, you know, change, we change the firm's policies and procedures if that is de deemed necessary. And if everyone, uh, if, if any of the team members have conducted anything, you know, inappropriate and if they have not complied with any professional standards or legal or uh, laws and regulations, etc., then we may have to take disciplinary action against them as well. Okay, folks, that's another aspect to think about. So these are basically what peer reviews are all about. It's just a simple concept. Just have to keep these in mind. Okay, folks. Now, moving on to the next aspect that is overall responsibility. So what is overall responsibility all about? Prior to dating the auditor's report, the engagement partner must ensure their involvement has been sufficient and appropriate throughout the audit engagement such that they have a basis for determining the significant judgments made and conclusions reached are appropriate. So what's the idea here, guys? 
the overall responsibility of the audit lies with the audit partner. Okay, folks, and this particular individual should devote sufficient and appropriate time to the review process of the audit. Okay, folks, so that's basically what is being mentioned here. He has to he has to devote sufficient amount of time to ensure that work has been conducted appropriately, and he must ensure that uh, you know. Uh, the judgments made are appropriate have we obtained sufficient appropriate evidence is the work conducted enough is the opinion appropriate okay, folks, so all these things must be finalized by the audit partner as simple as that now another aspect is that indicators that the engagement partner may not have had sufficient involvement with the engagement include lack of timely review by the engagement partner and lack of evidence of the engagement partner's direction and supervision okay folks a lack of involvement of the audit, uh, audit engagement partner is an indication of quality management issue okay folks so keep this in mind you could you know uh, you know see this in certain scenarios that can come up in the exam as well so just keep an eye out for it okay folks now moving on to the final element of quality management that is documentation so what is documentation all about let's take a look isa 220 revised requires auditors to document the following things okay so what all things do we have to document here conclusions reached with respect to the fulfillment of responsibilities relating to ethical requirements and acceptance and continuance okay so we should document the conclusions reached and what else the nature and scope and conclusions resulting from consultations undertaken during the course of the audit so if we have consulted uh, you know, another team member or an external consultation firm, then we must document that particular meeting as well. And, you know, what, what exactly has been discussed and what exactly has been, uh, has, has the issue been resolved? All these things should be documented. And what else? If the audit engagement is subject to an EQR, that the EQR has been completed on and or before the date of the auditor's report. So this particular thing should also be ensured as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically it. Uh, so these are basically the things that needs to be documented as part of, you know, ISC 220 requirements and what else during the completion of the audit, the engagement quality reviewer has to document the following thing. So this is something that the EQR must do, isn't it? So what all things should the EQR do? The name of the engagement quality control reviewer and individuals who assisted the review should be mentioned, should be documented and the engagement documentation should be reviewed. The basis for the conclusion on whether the requirements of ISQM2 have been fulfilled and whether the EQR is complete should be documented. And uh, that the engagement partner has been notified of any concerns about significant judgment made by the engagement team and the EQR is complete. Okay, folks, all these aspects as well as the date of completion of the EQR should be documented. Okay, folks, so these are just some you know, documentation aspects. That's basically all there is to it. And it's kind of obvious to think about as well, isn't it? So that's basically it. Okay, folks. So that's basically all about quality management. Now let's move on to another topic, shall we? So folks, the first thing that you have to keep in mind here is that as auditors, we document everything. And when I say everything, I mean everything. Now, why exactly do we do this? Let's understand that, shall we? Documentation provides sufficient records for the basis of the auditor's report. Okay, that's understandable, isn't it? Uh, it does, you know, provide a tangible evidence or it can act as a tangible evidence that we have collected sufficient and appropriate evidence, isn't it? And what else? It provides evidence that auditor, the audit was planned and performed in accordance with the applicable professional, legal and regulatory standards. Okay, that, that's something that it evidences as well. And what else? It assists the engagement team to plan and perform the audit. True statement, isn't it? So when we conduct a planning meeting, we document that particular planning meeting or the aspects that were discussed during the planning meeting. Why exactly is that? Because we can refer to this and uh, you know plan or create a bit more detailed plan accordingly, isn't it? So that's basically the thing. Now, it assists team members responsible for supervision to direct, supervise and review audit work. So what's the idea here, guys? It's basically the fact that it assists the team members for supervision and to direct, for example, Let's say that I have to conduct a review on the work conducted by one of my juniors. Now, if, if there was no tangible evidence of the work that work conducted by that by that particular junior, what, what would I have to do? I have to oversee what he's doing, uh, you know, uh, real time, isn't it? So much rather, if the particular junior has recorded everything within the work paper that he's working on, it'll be easier for me to review the work paper itself. 
uh, you know, and as a result, I'll be reviewing the work conducted by the junior just like that, isn't it? So it, it makes the review and detection and supervision a bit more uh, effective as well. What else? It enables the team to be accountable for its work. Okay, understandable. It allows record a record of matters to of continuing significance to be retained. So once we document everything, we can retain the work to a particular time period, isn't it? So that's basically something to keep in mind. And what else? It enables the conduct of quality management reviews and inspections. Okay, it's you know quality management reviews could be easily conducted by reviewing the you know documentations and what else? Tangible evidence of work done in support of the audit uh, opinion. So we have a tangible evidence of uh, the conclusions made, uh, you know, by, uh, on which the opinion was based on, isn't it? So that's basically it. And the document could be used as a defense in court for any negligence claim. Oh, so if, if there is any sort of, uh, you know, uh, litigation claims being raised against the audit firm, then, they, then we can use the, uh, you know, uh, documentation as evidence during court as well, isn't it? So that's basically the case mentioned over here. Okay, folks. Now, what is the form and content of documentation? Let's understand that, shall we? So the size and complexity of the entity will be documented. The nature of the audit procedures to be performed will be documented. The identified risk of material misstatement is most obviously will be documented, isn't it? The significance of the audit evidence obtained will be documented and the nature and extent of exceptions identify what are exceptions these are basically uh, i would say variances or deviations or unusual patterns or trends that's basically what we are talking about here okay folks so all these things will be documented now what else so what should the auditors document they should they should always mention in each and every work paper they should always mention what items were tested who did the testing when was the testing and who reviewed the work and when and finally the discussion of all these significant matters with management must also be must also be documented as well. Give up these others to what needs to be documented as well. So when we talk about documentation, there are you know specific types of documentation as well. Let's quickly go through those. Audit documentation can include the planning documentation, which is basically a documented form of the planning meeting conducted. There is audit programs, what all programs will be conducted during the course of the audit, summary of significant matters that we've identified, written representations from management will be retained and documented. There are checklists as well, which is basically a, a tick off list of certain things, isn't it? So that's basically it. Correspondence or confirmation letters will be documented. Or these are basically uh, the evidences obtained from third parties, isn't it? Such as customers, suppliers of the audit client, and uh, you know there are banks as well as third party inventory holders, etc. Isn't it? So that's basically the case. And finally, we have copies of client records as well. All those these things are certain types of documentations. Now, when we talk about work papers. There are different types of work papers that we're going to learn about here. First of all, there is something called standardized work paper. So what's the idea here? If this is basically to improve efficiency of audit work, but auditors may adopt a mechanical approach without judgment. So what the idea here is basically this. Each and every work paper will have a predetermined standard to it. Okay, folks, and what the auditor has to do is he just have to, you know, answer the questions stated within that or follow the format of that particular work paper. That's basically all they have to do. So there is an advantage, advantage to it as well as a disadvantage. The advantage is that it improves efficiency to a certain extent. And the disadvantage is that, you know, the auditor may not, you know, uh, put in some additional thinking to it. Okay, so they're just going to follow uh, a mechanical approach of, you know, following the format of that work paper. That's basically it. Okay, folks, since, the, since we already have a standard provided to us, we would much rather follow that standard and we don't necessarily have to point out anything extra or any, uh, we don't have to think outside the box or anything, isn't it? So that's basically the disadvantage here. Why? Because as auditors, if we do identify anything, you know, out of standard while conducting the audit work, then we should mention that in our work papers as well, isn't it? So using a standard, a standard standardized work paper will have its disadvantages as well. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. And what else? Then there are automated work papers as well. So what's the idea here? These are basically software packages that can make the work papers more technologically advanced. Okay, folks, so we have virtual work papers. It's not literally a paper, isn't it? So it's just that, you know, there would be some, uh, let's say, a form in your respective audit software in which 
there would be, let's say, a list of questions. However, if you answer, let's say, yes or, it, it, it might be a bit basic yes or no, or there would be some options given to you in that particular form, which you have to click according to the, you know, kind of audit, uh, audit client that you're dealing with, etc. And once you click on one particular question, uh, some additional questions in relation to that particular answer can, can pop up. Okay, folks, so there are some, you know, uh, technologically advanced work papers like that as well. And of course, you will get a better understanding if you, uh, whenever you, uh, if, if you plan on joining a particular audit firm to conduct these sort of works as well. Okay, folks, so there's that. Now, what is the advantage of this though? Let's understand that, shall we? The advantage of, advantage of this is that errors would be reduced to a certain extent, isn't it? So we won't be missing out on certain questions or we won't be, uh, you know, we won't be conducting any sort of errors within the work paper. And if, 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 if it happens, then that could be easily detected to a certain extent as well. And of course, it's neater as well as easier to review rather than, you know, handwritten work papers. And finally, time is saved to a certain extent as well. Okay, folks, so rather than preparing the work papers by hand, we ha already have it in a virtual environment, isn't it? So that's basically the thing. Okay, folks, so yeah, automated work papers does have their own advantages to it. Now, moving on to some more types of work papers. There are permanent work papers as well as current year work papers or current audit files as well, isn't it? Sorry, not work papers, audit files. Okay, folks, permanent as well as current audit files, isn't it? So first of all, let's talk about as to what permanent audit file is. Permanent audit file contains information of continuing importance to the audit. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, it basically includes things like the audit engagement letter, obviously, isn't it? So basically, the files that are contained within the permanent file can be used for recurring audits. Okay, folks, not just for one year, we can use it the next year and the next next year as well. So what all things are we talking about here? First of all, there is the audit engagement letter. There are new client questionnaires that can be used on a recurring basis. The memorandum of associate, memorandum of understanding and articles of association. The uh, other other legal documents such as prospectus, leases, and sales agreement. Details of the history of the client's businesses can be uh, considered as a permanent audit file. Uh, board minutes of continuing relevance can be uh, you know taken into consideration. Previous years signed accounts, analytical review and reports to management. And finally, accounting system notes, previous years, control questionnaires, all of these things can be retained for the current year as well. Okay, folks, so these are known as uh, permanent audit files. Now, what about current audit files? What does those things involve? Let's take a look. So current year audit files contain information which is relevant to the current year's audit. The current year, current audit file will follow the structure below. It will have some documents, uh, you know, from the planning stage of the audit or during the performance of the audit, as well as during completion and review as well. The okay, folks, and they contain things like the financial statements, which are relevant to the respective financial year, isn't it? And then we also have accounts checklists as well, a summary of unadjusted errors, uh, management account details. Uh, then we have, yeah, reconciliation of management and financial accounts, audit planning memorandum, Report, or, report to partners, including detail of significant errors and events, review notes, written representation, time budgets and summaries, communication with third parties such as experts or other auditors, notes to board, notes of board minutes as well as uh, report to management as well. So these are some of the things that can be included within the current year audit files. So, so, so current audit files. Okay, folks. Now, what else? Current audit files also contain work papers covering each audit area. These include the following things. Okay. So there could be a lead schedule, uh, including details of figures to be included in the accounts. For example, you know, these are like breakdowns of financial statements figures. Okay, folks, for example, if there is, let's say inventory or revenue, then we would have a lead sheet in relation to that stating the breakdown of these items as simple as that. And uh, what else? Problems encountered and conclusion drawn will be documented. And of course, audit programs, as we looked at earlier, risk assessment, detail of substantive tests and test of control, sampling plans, as well as analytical review as well. So all of these things will be included in the current audit files. Okay, folks, it's just a simple thing. That's basically all you have to keep in mind here. Now, moving on to the next aspect, modification of documents. So when you're modifying a particular document, all things should be considered here. 
So I'm talking about a document that's already completed, but you know, there are some minor changes to be made in that. That's basically the case. Okay, folks, if it is necessary to modify or add new audit documentation to a file after it has been assembled, the auditor should document two things. First of all, who made the changes and when and by whom they were reviewed. And finally, the reason for making the change as well. Okay, folks, so these two things should be mentioned if you're modifying a particular document. Now, what else? We also look at the security of work papers. So what's the idea here, guys? Work papers, as we all know, contain confidential information as well as commercially sensitive information, isn't it? So if it gets to the wrong hands, what would happen? There would be a leak of confidential information of the audit client, which can lead to several problems such as legal consequences against the audit firm. And more than about that, we are endangering the audit client's information as well, isn't it? So that's basically the thing. Okay, folks, so we have to secure our work papers appropriately. Because if lost, then your entire work is lost and your manager will make you redo all of your work. True statement, isn't it? So first of all, before me, you know, before he or she makes you do the particular redo the work, there would be a, you know, a lecturing session. Let's just call, a, call it a lecturing session as of now, because we all know what's going to happen, isn't it? So uh, that, that particular manager will, you know, give you some, let's say, life, let's call it life, life advices or, uh, you know, points to improve, uh, to put it very uh, in, a, in, a, in a soft manner. Uh, but yeah, we all know what's going to happen, uh, uh, you know, after it, right? So that's basically the thing. Okay, folks, you will have to redo all your work and you will have to, you know, hear things from your managers as well. So that's basically the reason why we should not, ne we should never, uh, you know, uh, or, or we should always secure our uh, work papers. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. And uh, another aspect is that these documents include, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, these documents include uh, sensitive and commercially sensitive and confidential information that may have legal consequences if fallen into the wrong hands, as simple as that. So moving on to the next aspect, and this is yet again a really important aspect. So in the modern era, we always keep our work papers within our laptops, isn't it? There is no, you know, tangible paper or anything as of now. So we, we keep all of the work papers within our, uh, you know, respective lap laptops and other IT systems itself. However, the thing is that, you know, the, the particular individual who's trying to steal this particular uh, stuff from us, he may not be looking for a particular uh, work paper itself, but rather he might be looking for the laptop itself, isn't it? So that's basically the thing. Laptop itself is a valuable asset and some people can steal it and sell it to for good money, isn't it? So that's basically the thing. Okay, folks, so we should, you know, keep our laptops secure as well. And as auditors, we, you know, live with our laptops, isn't it? We wake up with our laptop, we eat our breakfast with our laptop, lunch, dinner, etc., go to bed, etc. So that's basically the thing. Okay, folks, so we, we have it, you know, with us or, or, or during, or, during every phase of our, uh, you know, life. However, the problem is that if it gets stolen, that's going to be a big issue, isn't it? Because there will be local legal consequences against the firm due to our action uh, and uh, due to our, you know, uh, I would say negligence. And of course, uh, there would be a requirement to redo all of the work that uh, that was, you know, conducted uh, in that uh, which, which which were provided or which were included in that particular laptop as well. And of course, we need to, you know, find that particular laptop as soon as possible so that, you know, the information may not information does not get into the wrong hands isn't it so that's basically the thing so laptops are very susceptible to theft so not just for the contents but the machine itself unauthorized access should be prevented with the help of passwords this is because unauthorized editing can be harder to detect so what's the idea here guys so it's not just about the that's one uh, the, the security of the machine itself the laptop itself is one aspect the second aspect is there shouldn't be unauthorized access into the particular work papers etc okay folks because it kind of it, it would be a bit difficult to uh, you know detect that's basically the case an it based system should be subject to password encryption and backup procedures kind of obvious isn't it and so arrangements need to be made for secure storage there would should be 
uh, you know, archiving of old files as well as IT backups as well. For example, there are several other security measures as well. For example, in, um, in some audit firms, they tell you do not, you know, connect to any public Wi-Fi or do not, uh, you know, work in a public place, etc. So all of these measures are just to secure these confidential and commercially sensitive information. Okay, folks, it may be, you know, immaterial to my, you know, friend sitting next to me. However, it might be valuable to another, uh, you know, com uh, another employee of the of a competitor working uh, or of, of the of a competitor of the, uh, you know, audit client or something. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. So we keep, you know, keep the machine, you know, securely stored and the files should be stored securely as well. And of course, we should archive old files as well. We shouldn't just, uh, you know, print it out and keep it, uh, keep it, you know, uh, unnecessarily in a, on a open desk or something like that. And of course, we should also keep IT backups to ensure that no data is lost as well. Isn't it? So these are some security measures that we have to keep in place. That's basically it. Moving on to the final aspect that is retention of working papers. So what's the idea here guys? Audit files should be updated and finished in no later than 60 days after the report. Okay, that's that's kind of understandable, isn't it? So uh, what else? The ACCA recommends seven years as a minimum period while uh, IAC 230 requires a period of no less than five years from the date of auditor's report. So the idea here is that we must retain the particular uh, audit work papers for a particular period okay folks so, so this particular period is known as the retention period or the documentation retention period and this particular period would be you know as per the uh, auditing standard isa 230 it's five years no less okay folks it could be more but not less and as per acca's recommendation we should retain it for at least seven years okay folks so that's basically a guidance or a precaution or a you know, a warning provided by, you know, the professional standards as well as our professional body, just to ensure that we are retaining the information for, you know, whatever issue that, uh, if, if let's say there's a, some sort of issue that can arise in the after, let's say two or three years regarding the audit conducted a few years back, then we would need that record to prove that we have done the appropriate level of work, isn't it? So that's basically the case, okay, folks. So remember these rules, it's kind of a simple thing, isn't it? So just keep in mind and, you know, in your exam, it, you, it, it might come in handy, okay, folks, so keep this in mind. So, that's basically all about this particular session, okay, folks, so I will see you later in the next session where we will learn something interesting, okay, folks, so till then, this is Vishnu Vijay signing off.